Um, we'll move to our next um, uh, speaker, Michelle Tisdale. She's a social anthropologist and founder of Lift Every Voice. Um, and this is a project that she's been collecting um, posters during the demonstration um, to educate about the civil rights movement um, for some of those who don't know about the Left Project. Um, she's going to talk about today uh, on what, what can we learn um, from community narratives. Um, so, cool. You started sharing your screen. So, yeah, I'll let you. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kamam. Um, I would like to say that today I have, uh, I'm trying to combine my roles. I'm attempting to speak both as uh, a research librarian at the National Library and as um, the founder of an independent documentation project, uh, which I will talk about at the very end. And I have chosen to read my presentation uh, so that I can stay a bit on topic and so that I, my nerves don't uh, lead me astray. But I have been inspired by the other speakers and their fluidity. So I have uh, given myself a little bit of uh, leeway to go off script a little bit and to, to jump into the PowerPoint presentation. And I will ask Kama to um, indicate when I've spoken for 10 minutes so that I can quickly censor myself and move forward. Thank you. So what is the difference between casual storytelling and an exhibition in a history museum? Both can be informative. However, the former employs undocumented and non-expert knowledge whereas the latter uses approved and authorized historical postulation. Collecting source material and promoting the history and narratives of multicultural and minority communities require adequate competence, resources, and priorities. Sector-wide challenges and priorities can result in community perspectives and stories becoming objects of diversity initiatives and strategies. In this presentation, I will discuss the interaction of history and community narratives as articulations of perceived group experience. I discuss how lesser known and underrepresented knowledge coexists in public spaces, discourse and institutions such as the GLAM sector, the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, also known as the ABM sector in Norway. To this universe, we can also add news media entertainment and edutainment offerings. About the minor state of minorities and communities. I'm particularly concerned with the preservation of minority underrepresented and diverse narratives. In the edited book, A Literary Anthropology of Migration and Belonging, Roots, Roots and Rhizomes, Cecilia Fagerly and I note that being minor or marginalized is not an essentialized state. Rather, it is the situationally contingent and contested processual and multivocal qualities of such positions. Two examples are Queendom's 2008 satire, Updrag Norge, or Mission Norway, and Lovlin Rihelbrenner's 2012 memoir. My difference, my strength, which discuss growing up in Norway in the 1980s and 1990s. They resemble what Deleuze and Guattari describe as minor literature. The authors relate their individual stories to a political immediacy. They assume a collective value, and the works constitute a common action. My goal is to highlight the social relevance of community narratives for the stakeholders, institutions, gatekeepers, leaders, and other social actors who are responsible for comprehensive social documentation, preservation, and promotion in Norway, including journalism. I raise the issue to encourage communities to preserve their social documentation until they find institutions and organizations that have the competence and interest to preserve them on the community's own terms. So what are community perspectives? Where do we find them? 
When are they mobilized? How do they become narratives and historical representations in contemporary society? I regard community narratives as the wildly, widely held perceptions, beliefs, and opinions informed by experience, practices, tangible and intangible traditions, and that are created and circulated by a group or knowledge community. The perspectives constitute a statement of reality or a group's adopted self-characterization and can articulate its status and relation to external factors and conditions and to other social formation. These ideas and experiences may also be cultivated, hidden, and mobilized by the group in times of crisis and for collective action. Community narratives are produced by, about, and for the community. They are indigenous, endemic, and autochthonous. They are based on sociocultural and historical specificity. They may seem recognizable, yet the deeper meaning, relevance, and the hidden transcripts may be elusive and el ineligible to non-group members. Finding community narratives and perspectives. As a research librarian at the National Library and a social anthropologist 24 hours a day, I encounter community narratives all the time. This can happen during a taxi ride, in a conversation at the bus stop, and often as I browse the National Library's digital library. Editorials, autobiographies, song texts, novels, poetry, television programs, self-portraits, tattoos, archival projects, scrapbooks, journaling, collecting, not to mention social media image production can exemplify self-historicizing. They employ a process of assessing, contemplating, organizing, and resolving experience, experiences of the self in contact with society and external conditions. I identify the premises of such a statement. I outline, outline the claims and then look for repetitive themes and articulations of the idea across other contexts. Who said it? Why? Where? When? How many versions and articulations of this concept are circulating? What is the connection, if any, between the sources? Another aspect of this model is tracing how the ideas intersect with other known and hidden social facts. This means explaining how narratives act on information. The way that a narrative portrays the internal and external distinctions, boundaries, difference, affinity, cause and effect, motive, agency, change, and resolution of a question are of particular interest. The work of self-historicizing is my main concern, and I am inspired by the work of Janet Hopkins, Marianne Legulista, Michelle Rolf Trio, Mary Louise Pratt. They explore narratives and narrative practice, self-historicizing, and how individuals participate and exist with history. Self-historicizing can take many forms and is a common aspect of daily life and at the core of heritage and history production. It is helpful to trace and compare this narrative practice within and across communities, temporalities, forms, and contexts. Making sense of the experiences of the self and its contact with society is the work of self-historicizing and involves creativity. And it is a way of being in the world and a way of acting on the world. So narrative practice and storytelling are not merely a response to the world, but articulate the world and are a way of participating in the world and extending the self as McLean notes. Both native and anthropo anthropological stories, and indeed all stories, could be understood as less as representing a world external to themselves than as participating in and extending the self-making of a world, which such stories are both a product and an integral part. When investigating narratives, it is useful to consider the relationship between experience and representation, according to Janet Hoskins. Narratives represent life as lived life as experienced, and life as told. 
these are some examples of um, my trying to promote uh, minority, diverse, and community narratives at the National Library, where I've worked for 13 years. And these are examples of some of the book displays that I have um, presented over the years. And some of the other materials that we have in the collection um, that I try to promote as much as possible when given the opportunity. Just so you know, Michelle, 10 minutes has passed. Thank you. The first, so back to narratives and the, the, the connection between experience and representation. The first refers to what happens to a person. Life is lived. The second to images, feelings, sentiments, desires, and meanings that the person might ascribe to, the, to these events. And then the third to a narrative influenced by the context in which it is told the audience, and the cultural notions of storytelling. Narratives enable the construction and reconstruction of self and society. And in this sense, items that enable narratives can function as biographical objects. So because I work at the National Library and I work in the section for books and languages, I have taken a particular interest in um, autobiographies and biographies that um, uh, represent or articulate uh, minority experiences and experiences of diversity and multiculturalism in Norway. The narratives of Queendom and Brenna discuss meaning making, self identity, belonging, and Norway as an emerging multicultural society. These texts explore interactions between individual experience and notions of self and specific social categories, ideals, norms, and stereotypes in public discourse. Belonging, for example, refers to an experience of fitting in, a close relationship or acceptance as opposed to an experience of distance or estrangement from families, communities, and society. These are just some other examples. Um, that some have been mentioned today, but I just want to show them. Hoskin uses the term biographical objects to describe items that people use in narrative and form formative processes of self-representation, identification, and self-historicizing. Biographical and autobiographical literature contains community narratives and perspectives. The life narratives, according to Gulesa, of Brenna and Queendom identify them as members of source communities or knowledge communities. These examples of life writing articulate emic frames of meaning and individual experience of minority situations in social life. A clear message of the Queendom story is that Norwegian, African, and other third cultural citizens are unrepentantly Norwegian and Scandinavian. Also, in Brenna's narrative, she also uh, focuses on the theme of belonging and migration. She says, this reminded me of my parents and most of the Indians I knew. For various reasons, they had moved from India. They had been uprooted from one soil and would be replanted in the new soil. They had managed to cut over the roots, many of the ties of their parents, siblings, neighbors, friends, country, and surroundings. Without being aware of it, they had lost, they had a plastic bag around the roots. The plastic bag was made of the love they felt for parents, siblings, and other people in their home country. The language, tradition, history, religion, memories, and everything that had shaped their identity. All of these translations are from Norwegian and they're my translations, by the way. So if they don't make sense, you can blame me. These are, these, these are not the author's uh, translations, they're mine. In Brenda's tale, the Indian community in Kristiansand resembles a colony of fruit trees with plastic bags around the roots. Transplanting involves not merely moving a tree to a new location, but also preparing and tending to its rhizomatic roots. Her parents, like many of the immigrant generation, hoped to return to India after retiring. As she explained, many Indians in the community had as much focus on life in India as they had on daily life in Norway. 
So community narratives portray ideas that individuals hold about self and society as well. And Gulista investigates narrative practice in relation to the cognitive functions involved in self-formation and processes of discovery, self-discovery. In her work, in her work, there it is, Everyday Life Philosophers, Modernity, Morality, and Autobiography in Norway. She investigates um, autobiography, life history, and interrelated subsystems of knowledge, namely expert knowledge and the law, knowledge of lay people or non-experts. She, the personal narratives about self-identity draw attention to the transformative processes of self-formation and social change. In this way, self-historicizing also intersects processes of historical production. This is important if we think of community narratives and perspectives as alternative articulations about society and as existing in the same universe as media representation and other historical narratives created by institutions, for example, like my own institution and other institutions. Inspired by Gulisa, I regard authors of autobiography and authors of community narratives as everyday life philosophers and chroniclers of Norwegian society. By extension, community perspectives can also reflect similar analyses and perceived truths about society. So, One of the inspirations uh, for my work is Michelle Roth Trio. And community narratives can represent alternatives to, this, to the stories created by institutions and the media. The local understandings can also represent perspectives that reflect the minor state. In silencing the past, power and the production of history, Michelle Roth Trio is concerned with how power influences history and how it can create historical silences that mute facts and individual experience. His focus is on process, production, and narration. What happens? How is the story created? What is the difference between what happened and what is reported, described, or becomes history? History as social process, he says, involves people in three distinct capacities. As agents, or occupants of structural positions, as actors in constant inter interface with the context, and as subjects, that is, as voices aware of their vocality. So um, I would like to jump uh, forward if Kamen can tell me how many minutes are remaining and give another example. Well, about two minutes. Excellent. I will jump uh, straight to This, uh, the last example, which is the example of the documentation project that I started last uh, June as a result of the um, We Can't Breathe Justice for George Floyd uh, solidarity protest that Rahwa and uh, the ASA and Arise and so many other people were instrumental in, in planning um, because I had a notion that we needed to do something so that the moment and the engagement and the narratives that emerged uh, in that particular moment, that collective mobilization of narratives, community narratives and individual perspectives wouldn't be lost and forgotten and couldn't be easily swept under the rug. So what I did was uh, start to collect some of the posters from the demonstration. These are an example of some of the posters that have been donated with the help of lots of people. And you can see that a lot of the messaging, for me, they represent community narratives. Even though they're written by individuals, they come together in the protests where more than 15,000 people in Oslo, but then if you count people around the country, um, very many people participated and there are a lot of themes that repeat. 
here you'll see Benjamin Hermanson and uh, Eugene Obiora, um, Johanna um, Ottovibaham Carlson, and other victims of Norwegian racism. So this is there's a claim here in this poster that Norway is not innocent, and there are also victims of racism in Norway who should be remembered. Here again is um, in pro police brutality, and then I paired it with um, a poster about Obiora. And here's another example of some of the posters that have been collected and that were used in the Oslo demonstration. So narratives are not only distilled from life, they also flow back into life. And by creating a documentation project to just preserve a sample of the different uh, examples of these biographical objects that the posters, the spontaneous posters represent, I'm trying to have these narratives flow back into social life and not just disappear as Rah Rahwa alluded to in her presentation. Um, and Common and the Oslo Desk um, and I have partnered together in order to create a more comprehensive uh, set of documentation about the protest. And with video and photographs from the Oslo Desk along with the posters, um, we, have, we are trying to continue to hold these narratives alive and also to use them to inspire other narratives about anti-racism and civil rights in Norway to emerge so that we can go back in time and look at the moment from last summer as one moment in a, continu a continuous, um, how should I say, timeline about anti-racism in Norway and also about community narratives. This is the exhibition that Common and I did at Kunsthal Trondheim in November, uh, from November to January recently. So with that, I'll say thank you. And um, again, Common, thank you for including me and thank you for inviting me. And I hope that this presentation, um, I don't know, resonates with the journalists and those of you interested in journalism as well.